Good evening and welcome to q and I'm Tony Jones and here to answer your questions tonight, the Deputy Opposition Leader, Tanya Plibersek, Human Rights Commissioner and Classical Liberal, Tim Wilson, one of Australia's most experienced journalists, the editor-at-large of The Australian, Paul Kelly, Curtin Uni counter-terrorism expert, Dr Anne Ali, and cosmologist and passionate advocate for science and reason, Lawrence Krauss. Please welcome our panel. Well, as you may have noticed, two of our advertised guests, Parliamentary Secretary Alan Tudge and the Director of the Menzies Research Centre, Nick Cater, withdrew at the last minute. Now, we find ourselves in an unusual situation tonight because clearly one of the biggest and most controversial issues of the past week has been about events that occurred on our own program. We've been the subject of a great deal of comment from politicians and from other media. The ABC itself has acknowledged that an error was made in having Mr Zaki Maller live in the studio. And as we go to air tonight, there is more than one inquiry underway. It's clear, therefore, that the issue will come up for discussion tonight and we'll do our best to handle that in the same way we would any other issue. Others can and will, no doubt, judge this program and the ABC. And my role tonight is not to preempt that or to put any particular view, but it is appropriate to put a few facts on the record. First of all, the decisions made about Q&A are made by the whole program and management team and we all take responsibility for them. In considering the decision to allow Zaki Maller to ask a question, the ABC's editorial standards tell us to present a diversity of perspectives so that over time no significant strand of thought or belief within the community is knowingly excluded nor disproportionately represented. Now, secondly, the safety and security of our panellists and the audience is always a key priority for us. And finally, the Q&A team were not aware at the time Zaki Maller appeared of the very offensive misogynistic tweet that he put out about two female journalists. Had we known, we would have rejected his participation. Now, let's move on with the program and your questions. And our first question tonight is, in fact, a Facebook question that comes from Freddie Warren. Q&A featured a self-described Muslim activist who tweeted about gang-raping female columnists in January and pleaded guilty to threatening to kill an ASIO officer. Does Q&A think the views of a man who suggested gang rape were worthwhile? And we'll start with Tanya Plibersek. Hmm. Well, I think, uh, I think it clearly was an error of judgment, Tony, and the ABC has said that and said it very quickly the following morning. Uh, I think... Um, given the very offensive tweet that you've just referred to uh, and some of the history of Mr Maller, it, it, it was an error of judgement. But I think we also have to be quite careful of the way uh, that the government has responded. I think some of the response has been um, really quite emotional in its tone and not, uh, not productive. I don't always like what the ABC broadcasts. I've had a uh, three very uncomfortable Tuesday nights over the last few weeks. And uh, what I'd say about the ABC is, even when I don't agree with it, I see that it does a really important job and um, plays a very worthwhile role in our community. So I'd say it was an error of judgement. I don't think Mr Maller's views are ones that I particularly want to see broadcast. Um, but I'd also caution uh, people who are... Um, you know, have already cut half a billion dollars of funding from the ABC, have cut the Australian network completely. Uh, caution uh, that further attacks on the ABC are not helpful. Um, let's quickly address the other issue raised here, the fact that Mr Maller pleaded guilty more than 10 years ago to threatening to kill an ASIO officer. Should that conviction have ruled him out as a questioner? In and of itself. Look, I, I, uh, I think that's a very difficult proposition. Um, and, in fact, Anne's written a lot about... Uh, encountering violent extremism, the, the voices of people who've been de-radicalised and how important they are in the debate. So I couldn't make that judgement without knowing a lot more about him and his beliefs and his behaviour and what he's said in the past. Um, but uh, uh, I do think it, it is important to take into account we are in a heightened threat environment. That's not make-believe. That is actually true. And so when you're um, airing uh, voices that are um, arguing for uh, extremist causes uh, or behaviour, you need to be very cautious. I thought Walid Ali's interview uh, with Zaki Mala the following day it was a very good interview because he pushed Mr Mala um, 
significantly on his own responsibility for what he was saying, and I think that was a, a very appropriate. Right, you mentioned Anne Ali there. Let's hear from her on the subject. Well, first of all, I think that um, let's get it very straight. Nobody in the history of mankind has ever or will ever be radicalised by anything that Zaki Mullah has said. Mm. Uh, we are not about to see a mass exodus to Syria because of a public stoush between a minister and somebody wearing a funny hat on Q&A. Let's make that clear. Um, secondly, I think it was a missed opportunity because I think the Australian public deserves to hear a rational debate about issues of uh, national security and issues of national significance that affect them. And I uh, think that that debate should happen uh, without any political grandstanding and without any uh, over-emotional outbursts, as um, happened on the Q&A show. Uh, I think it was a missed opportunity for uh, the minister in question to respond rationally yeah. to uh, Zaki's question and to open up a debate that needs to be had. These questions need to be asked and the Australian public deserve answers and they deserve answers in a rational, logical, calm manner. Um, I think, you know, we need to stand up as a public here as Australians and say we deserve better than this. We deserve to have these issues brought to our attention and we deserve to have the answers to these questions free from political point scoring. Um, Anne Ali, because the, uh, the questioner is not in the studio to ask this, I'll ask it on his behalf. Uh, let's go back to the question. Do you think the views of a man who suggested gang rape are worthwhile? Not that um, we knew about it at the time. Look, I didn't know about um, his tweet about gang rape either, and my understanding was that that was a tweet that was uh, very quickly taken down. Um, and, you know, I've seen some pretty disgusting things by a whole lot of people on Twitter, and some of them directed at me and some of them directed at some people that I know as well. Um, and not to excuse that at all. Uh, absolutely, there is no excuse. And so I think that had the ABC and Q&A known about that particular tweet, I think that uh, my understanding is that you probably wouldn't have had him on as you mentioned uh, earlier, Tony. Um, in terms of his being a convicted uh, 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 criminal, he's done his time. Mm -hmm. um, he's, uh, he's paid his price. Uh, we are a society that recognises that. We are a society that recognises that people who, who have done their time <laughs> and who have the capacity to then turn around uh, deserve a chance. Um, and I think we should uh, show that uh, in, in all forms of, okay. of public life. Let's hear from Paul Kelly on this. I'll come to you in a minute, Lawrence. Uh, look, I think this is uh, not an issue of uh, free speech, as Mark Scott uh, pretended uh, last week. Um, this was a serious uh, editorial mistake uh, by the ABC. Media organisations have got to be very careful about who they put up in lights, about who they give a platform to. And it would have been possible to have a lot of other uh, Muslims in the audience raising these sorts of issues. The ABC chose not to do that. I find it extraordinary that we're being told today that he would not have been asked on the program if people had known what he said in terms of his sexist and misogynist past and the threats he'd made about female journalists. We're told that that would have ruled him out of the program, but the fact that he uh, had been uh, prosecuted with terrorism, the fact that he had admitted that he uh, threatened Australian officials and wanted to kill them, the fact that he'd served time, that he had a weapons arsenal, that he was conducting a campaign to publicise jihad, nonetheless, that's OK. Well, it's not OK. It's not OK in terms of the ABC taking a decision about who's going to appear on Q&A and who is going to confront a government minister, a government minister about citizenship policy. Well, um, uh, can I just interrupt you there? Uh, back in uh, 2012, September, your own paper ran a story about Mala headlined, Rebel Urges Mus Muslims to Wage a Jihad of Peace. Mm. Now, I imagine you're aware of the content of that story. I'm aware of that story, yeah. but that story, that story is a separate issue from giving him a platform, giving him a platform on this program. As I said... Can, I, can, I, can I just... Uh, just uh, sorry, briefly, can, can I just quickly go to a point that was in the story? So the story in your paper said his experience going to Syria, Syria had showed that hate and violence were self-defeating. The more you fight, the more you lose, says Mala in the story. 
The more you have hatred, this anger, the more you feel victimised. Now, would it have been wrong of the program makers to take that into account when forming a judgement about him? No, I don't think it would have been wrong, but I'd make two points about what you've just said. I'm very well aware that uh, the most effective uh, form of persuading people against going to Iraq and Syria is to have jihadists who have repented and to expose them to people who want to go to Iraq and Syria. I'm very well aware that this is an enormously effective tool to persuade people against it. But this is not, this is not why he was on the program. He was on the program not to have, as far as I'm concerned, not to have a proper debate about the issue. This was a gotcha moment. This was a tabloid gotcha moment. He was picked out to embarrass the government on this issue and in that sense, he had the wrong background. Uh, the fact that he'd repented, I think, is very good. But I don't think that excuses the choice made right. at the time. Let's get a quick response uh, from Anne Ali on that very question. So what I'm hearing is that he's good enough for your paper, but he's not good enough for Q&A. Yeah, yeah. um, that's, no. that's, that's what I'm hearing here. No, no, no. Our, our, paper, our paper didn't put him up on lights because we're not able to do that the way the ABC did on this program and counterpose him against the government to embarrass the government over citizenship law. Now, but it was now, the government's now, response that created the ongoing thing. It was had the, the minister, Had the minister, or the parliamentary secretary, I'm sorry, had he responded in a manner where he actually answered Zaki's question, I doubt that the, uh, the, the, the situation would have been blown out of proportion as it had, has been. Um, and that's why I say it was a missed opportunity and why I think Australians deserve better uh, to hear about these issues in, manner, in a manner that is free from political grandstanding. OK, uh, Lawrence Krauss is trying to jump in. I also yeah, I'm jumping because I came Wilson in from outside. I have to say, in terms of make, make a platform for this guy, it seems to me the government has made the platform. I wouldn't have known who he was, I wouldn't have heard about him if I hadn't arrived in this country and seen all this stuff about this guy. And then I went and watched the question, and the question was kind of silly and innocuous. The, in terms of embarrassing the government, it seemed to me the government did a good job of embarrassing itself. The response of that minister was ridiculous. Moreover, I mean, this was, I wrote a book about something from nothing. It seems to me that you proved it's possible. And, and, <laughs> and, and, and uh, uh, the last thing I want to say is, his, some of his views, which I've looked at since then, are clearly despicable. But in a society, we have to be willing to have discussions about despicable views. And I was amazed. I was on this program speaking of despicable views with uh, Fred Nile a, a, a few years ago, and no one wrote, uh, uh, headline stories saying that a hateful uh, person who has not misogynistic views but anti-gay anti views was allowed on a program. He was allowed. We had a discussion, a relatively polite discussion, but at least it raised, in my mind, the ridiculousness of his opinions. And a reasonable discussion could have raised the ridiculousness of this guy's opinion. OK, um, Tim Wilson, I'd like to hear your view on this and uh, reflect on the question that was originally asked, if you can. Well, I'll be brutally honest. I actually think the producers and yourself, Tony, you ought to be ashamed of yourself for giving them a platform. Um, the issue at heart is the ABC chose to give this person a platform on live television, precisely as Paul was outlining. And um, people can have their own views um, about issues and no-one is calling for this individual to be silenced or censored. No one has called for that. I think the minister. Can I think just 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 a just a qualifying no just a qualifying point. I think the minister on the night did say he would quite like to see him deported from yeah, the country. Yeah, that's amazing. But he did, and but that does not silence or censor him. Yeah, but I, I'm, I'm certainly. <laughs> well, no, I'm, still, I'm not sure how it does. I mean, he's still welcome to speak. No, no. I'm, so I'm simply making the point there that um, that that view would be seen by some as being out of order as well. Uh, that a citizen that, that a citizen should be expelled mm -hmm. from the country. Well, and uh, the minister has expressed himself. I'm bringing it back to the root of the issue, which is what the ABC did. It chose to give him a live platform to express a view. It is bad because it denied the opportunity for somebody who was sensible and rational and credible to actually talk about the serious points around citizenship that exist in Australia and around those laws, which I have ex myself expressed genuine concerns about. But for then the ABC to turn it into some sort of free speech issue and try and project it as though the ABC uh, had made just a simple error of judgment and invoke the idea that people, uh, that this was akin to the Charlie Hebdo massacres, I found laughable and contemptuous of the substance of the issue at heart. 
And I thought it was actually a tragedy that the Mark Scott chose to go and do it that way uh, and actually, in essence, mocked the memory of those people and what they actually stood and died for. And to be brutally honest, Tony, when I first came on this program in 2008, it was an environment where we had serious policy discussion. Too often these days, it's caught up with gotcha moments and snide remarks designed to get attention, extra attention in the news cycle. And that is what that was, and it blew back on this show and to its detriment. Let's go to our next question, which is on the same subjects, from Michael Daly. Although the Australian Constitution does not explicitly protect freedom of expression, the High Court has held that there is an implied freedom of political communication. Therefore, while I disagree with the comments made by Zaki Mallah last week, we have an obligation to honour his right to say them. However, as a result of what he said, members of our community could have been encouraged to join an uprising against Australia. If that were the case, and my safety were to be jeopardised, would you consider restricting freedom of speech? Where do you draw the line between protecting free speech and defending national security? Um, and Tim Wilson, I'll start with you. I know we ended with you, but I'll start sure. with you on that free speech question. Well, well the individual rationalised joining ISIS off the back of an exchange. I think his comments were uh, poor. Uh, I don't think the uh, exchange was particularly um, uh, edifying for anybody, to be brutally honest. But I think it was good that the minister also gave a strong uh, message back. But uh, the practical reality is nobody... By the way, uh, the, the minister uh, took his comments to mean that uh, the government's policies, he was, that the questioner was arguing that the government's policies would push people towards ISIS. Is that, a, is that an assessment you agree with? Well, no, I was about to actually make the precise point, which is I agree. Nobody's probably gone off the back of his comments and gone off and joined ISIS because... Uh, no, he, but what, do you, what, what did you think the comment... Oh, this is my point. I, the, the minister thought the comments were about government policies pushing people towards ISIS. What do you think the comments were about? Well, I think his comments were about precisely what he said, which is he thought that the policy of the government was rationalising or justifying people go off and, and uh, joining ISIS. That was what he clearly expressed. I don't think that is what the consequence was. I think we need a very serious issue around uh, discussion, uh, around citizenship. But, you know, I've been quoted about this in the past week. I think as soon as his comments were read, it was quite clear that he was putting it bluntly, a bit of a nutter. I don't think anyone would have taken them that seriously. But that is not the issue. The issue is why the ABC gave this person on live television a platform to exercise his views and express it because, in the end, people have a certain credibility test about whether they uh, should appear on these programs and I don't think he passes it and I question why the ABC did it. All right. Uh, uh, Lawrence Krauss well, wants to jump in. I want to respond to the actual question, which was free speech versus <laughs> national security. And this actually concerns me about this whole issue, which hasn't been touched. And probably the first time I disagreed with you, Tanya, about anything. But this, since I've come here, I've seen story about story. So I looked at The Australian today and it was every story was about how I should be scared by terrorism. And it seems to me this notion that national security is so, so threatened by, by actually very few people having actually been threatened in Australia, that it's scaring people. And, and I can't help but think, uh, remembering uh, an, a line of actually Hermann Goering, uh, who said, democracy, dictatorship, doesn't matter. You want to make people do what you want them to do? Make them afraid. And I find this, this attitude that's happening here of getting people afraid of terrorism, so afraid that you can't even talk about it on TV, I find that terrifying. Um, and Ali, would, first of all, can you address the, uh, the questioner? Because the perception of that questioner, and it's the perception of a lot of people, including many politicians, is that that was a call to uh, young Muslims to go and join a jihad to join ISIS. Is that how you understood what he was saying? Look, I don't think Zaki was very good at, at expressing himself. He's certainly not very articulate in, in that regard. But I think the crux of what he was saying was that, uh, very much so, that the government policies are, uh, are alienating uh, young people to the point that they are contributing to radicalisation. Now, if I was to respond to Zaki, I would say to him very rationally that, OK, that can't be, the, the, that, that is not the singular point upon which radicalisation occurs. And in fact, to, uh, to simplify, to oversimplify radicalisation to one dimension, that it's only about Western intervention or it's only about government policies or it's only about this or it's only about that, is fundamentally flawed. Radicalisation is in fact a very complex issue. And uh, of course, uh, government policies play into it. It is part of the, part of the puzzle, you know. Every uh, student of Terrorism 101 knows straight away that uh, counter-terrorism, that 
in, in an asymmetric warfare environment, the enemy seeks to force governments to do things that alienate and that cause their populations to turn against them and become part of uh, the, the enemy's um, uh, community or the, the, the enemy's groups. So Terrorism 101, the first thing that you do is you don't play into the enemy's hands. And unfortunately, when uh, issues like national security become so politicised uh, that they do become part of a political agenda, this plays into ISIS's hands. Um, the things that we end up doing in, in restricting civil liberties, even the removal of citizenships, we need to ask, what is the end game here? Is the end game to defeat ISIS? Because if the end game is to defeat ISIS, you're playing right into their hands. The first thing that they do with their propaganda is tell young people to reject their Australian citizenship, to reject their Australian identity. The first thing that they do when they get over there is burn their passports and, and forget that they were ever Australian. Why are we doing that for them? How is, that, how is that part of defeating ISIS? It's not just counterproductive, it's futile. Okay, the, the questioner um, clearly understood uh, what Zaki Mallah said to be different to what you think he said. I mean, mm. how do you explain the discrepancy? Is it simply a matter of poor English, poor expression? Or, I mean, how do you explain that? I mean, you know Zaki Mallah. I, I do. I, 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 I know Zaki and I've worked with a lot of formers. Uh, formers being people who were either once jihadists or white supremacists, who once were part of these organisations or who once had certain ideological viewpoints. And when you talk to them, not all of them are so far along their journey that they're able to articulate how they were in their past life and, and why they left their past life. Some of them are still going through that process. Some of them are still suffering the trauma of who they were and coming to terms with that. Some of them are very articulate and they've moved through that journey and they've been able to reconcile that and are very strong advocates and very strong activists and are very politically savvy and very media savvy and, and, and know how to put their ideas and their thoughts and their expressions across. Zaki isn't there yet. He would be if he had support. <coughs> Paul Kelly. And we can address the question if we can. In fact, I'll come back to the question in a minute if you'd like to hear whether you are hearing something different than you originally understood or whether you'd like to add to the conversation. Uh, so. No, I'd rather not add. OK. <laughs> <laughs> Just in relation to this point about free speech, the issue here is not free speech. It is not free speech. He's got the right to free speech whenever and wherever he goes. The issue here, just to come back to the central point about the program, was he was invited on the program, I believe, to create an exciting and inflammatory exchange, and that's precisely what happened. He was not invited onto the program to have a sensible debate about these issues. Now, in relation to um, uh, the issue that you've talked about, I agree completely um, with the need to uh, engage jihadists, particularly jihadists who have repented. I think they are enormously valuable to the cause. Where I disagree with you, I think it's a mistake to say, in order to ensure that we don't alienate uh, such people, we are therefore uh, not entitled to pass new national security laws advised by the Security and Intelligence Services uh, uh, advised by uh, the government, embraced by the government, supported by the Labor Party, uh, a whole range of security laws, including the citizenship laws. Now, to actually say, sorry, we're not going to do any of these things that are recommended by the security and intelligence agencies, simply because we are concerned about the effect that it will have on some of the potential jihadists. I think, I think that's wrong. Think We've Anne got to get the balance that. right. No, I, don't, I, don't, I, don't I didn't Anne say that, that at all. I didn't fair. say you're not entitled. Well, okay, well, what sorry. I'm saying is from a pure counter-terrorism perspective, from a pure counter-terrorism perspective, free of politics, free of emotion, free of anything else, to play into ISIS's hands and do what they want you to do is counterproductive. This is logic. It is not, uh, it's not politics, it's not anything else, it is logic. Okay. If you want to beat them, I... don't play yeah, the well, game. No, but I want to hear w whether Tanya Plibersek agrees with that logic as expressed. Well, uh, look, there was a terrific um, article in, uh, I think it was The Atlantic, uh, Graham Wood, What ISIS Really what Wants. What ISIS Really Wants, yeah. yeah. A few months ago, maybe March, April, and mm. I thought... Uh, it is actually, to read that article um, and to get some sort of insight into 
just how completely disjointed our worldviews are is really instructive. Um, the, the question about uh, the citizenship laws that Paul has raised is a separate question. In January last year, Tony Abbott and the government started talking about stripping people of their citizenship. It's taken them 15 or 16 months, Paul, to bring legislation to the parliament. It was rushed in in the final days of the last sitting period. Uh, we were refused briefings until the last minute. Uh, and while the Liberal government were calling on Labor to be bipartisan, they were sending out fundraising emails on the back of this legislation. They were dragging camera crews through ASIO headquarters. And a leaked question time brief showed that the government were all about um, actually having as big a gap between themselves as Labor uh, and Labor as possible. So I think you, um, it's unfair of you to suggest, Anne, that, that she's positing some, you know, the government can't act on national security unless we make terrorists angry. It is a fundamental issue. Our, the, the national security uh, is the most important baseline proposition for any government and for any opposition. The security and welfare of our people is our first and most important responsibility. Uh, but for the government to set this up in some way as they're in favour of that safety and security and, and anybody who, who questions, demands detail, asks for, for example, in our case, the Joint Security and Intelligence Committee to examine legislation is somehow not on Team Australia, that's a problem. Well, I certainly agree with what you're saying there. There's no doubt that the government is uh, mobilising uh, this issue for domestic political purposes and the language is unacceptable. The point remains though, Tanya, is the government legislation correct or not? Will Labor support it or vote against it? Well, That's the issue at the it, end of well, the, the day. Good, it, it the good the thing issue. is, despite what has already been said, we actually are able to debate national security yeah. legislation. And that is partly why it ends up on the front page of the paper, because it's topical. Because the fact Actually, the first time it ended up on the front page, I think, was when uh, there was a dispute was... in Cabinet about it. it sure, uh, that's right. Because there wasn't a leak that's from precise, Cabinet. That's there precise was a transcript. The there was that six is senior the ministers. We, we are able to debate it because proposals are put up, they are considered and they are rejected. Now, the, the process about whether it came from Cabinet or not is to me, irrelevant. If they hadn't have addressed no. those issues, we still would have had this discussion. But to and that way, no, 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 you cannot the, the, the fact of the matter is, yeah. it is good it that we have had guy. this debate because nothing else, we have had a significant downscaling of the proposal because going precisely to the point that was raised before, you do not want to do the job of terrorist groups in the process of trying to design national security laws, which is why we have to stand up and defend very strongly the principle of the rule of law and making sure that laws are structured well. But, but this, and we have got to a much better standard. We are still not there. There are still provisions but within the current bill said, and you that need to be discarded. Okay. This minister said, as I listened to the program, and you just defend him, that he would deport this guy for saying stupid things. Is that... National no, security, is that free speech? He didn't say because of stupid things. He said it was because he had threatened the lives of ASIO officers. And what I was saying but was... He, was was good that he, he said incorrectly. He said incorrectly that uh, that has been glossed over as well, that Zaki was um, was acquitted because of uh, because the law was retrospective, which is not true. He was, he was acquitted, acquitted because he was found innocent. T Tony, I think t Tim said something a minute ago that, that was very important. He said... It doesn't matter how it happens. It doesn't matter whether it went to Cabinet. And I, no, I, I didn't think say this that. What I said was it, it didn't matter that it was leaked out of Cabinet versus the proposal being made public. No. Well, well it is I, actually I, I, would I, say, I would say, Tim, that it, it is... <coughs> if, if you do not have good Cabinet processes, this should have gone to Cabinet as a piece of legislation, not mm -hmm. as a thought bubble. Mm -hmm. It should have been debated by the Cabinet, uh, possibly by the National Security Committee of Cabinet before it went to Cabinet. It there was, should have been it was. A firm... It was a decision taken there by was the National no Security Committee Paul. of Cabinet. There was no legislation until this week. There was no sure. legislation. How if can you debate an idea? If you're talking about the Cabinet procedures, I'll tell you what happened. We make it went laws to the National Parliament. Security Committee of ideas. Cabinet. A decision was taken. A decision was taken. Now, normally that suffices. The Prime Minister then raised the issue at the end of a Cabinet meeting and that provoked this substantial debate. And uh, Paul, six Paul can, I just, can, I just, uh, can I just ask you a question? And it is this. Um, as I recall it, uh, Zaki Mallow's question went to whether or not a sole citizen <coughs> could be caught up in these laws. And then on the front page of The Australian this weekend, there's a suggestion that that might happen. So um, I'm just wondering whether there was a relevance to the question that he asked. 
You mean he was prescient? Uh, look, um, uh, well... No, I'm asking whether the question was relevant to people who are sole citizens who may be charged as terrorists. Well, the question may be relevant. I'm not saying the question is not relevant. I'm simply saying it was inappropriate for him to be here at the time. Look, look... But if his question is relevant, doesn't that sort of slightly undermine that position? No, I don't think so. I don't think so. Look, look... To be brutally honest, look, Tony, you could look, have found much better representatives of the Muslim well, community course, to raise these issues but, than well, that. It would always be better well, representatives, but his question Muslim. was relevant. Well, can I just make the point? Yeah, that's can, right. I, can, can I, you rather, can I, can can I just make the point? Can I just make the point? Wouldn't you rather people have credibility and substance? I don't know, a lot of people I've been speaking to in the Muslim community are pretty can, angry. Can, 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 I just make, can I just make the point? Can I just make the point? Can I just make the point, sorry, that the, the, the fundamental purpose of this program is to allow citizens to ask questions. Of course. Now, he's Representing a citizen themselves. and Representing he asked himself. a question. Yeah. He enrolled to come into the program. It's not quite as you said. Well, Just because sorry, you organised for him to ask the question. And uh, this is... No, that's incorrect. Well, well, sorry, the fact of the matter is, you, what, he didn't have a question pre-written up like everybody else does. He did write a question. Yes, that's right, and it was through, through the questions and the normal processes. Mm -hmm. The fact of the matter is, he should not have been given a platform. There are much better representatives to debate the issues <laughs> of citizenship... Why not have not been given a platform? Nothing community. about representatives here. Muslim communities don't have representatives. Yeah. No. Okay, and and just because someone stands up and says the Muslim community doesn't mean that everyone thinks that they are the 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 sole icon of what it means to be Muslim in Australia. So you know the whole idea that first of all he's doing this because he's a member of the Muslim community, a representative of the Muslim community. You can forget that because he's not. He never even said he was. It was a question about himself. Yeah, I watched it. Was it. it was a he question. Said, I, I had this happen to me. I'm representing myself. How would you have responded? And he got a ridiculous, idiotic response. No, it was a silly question. <laughs> the question was incoherent. <laughs> OK, this just... Wait. Wait. Oh, sorry, sorry. Seems to further demonstrate the ABC doesn't actually get what they did. Um, <laughs> we'll, uh, we'll... Well, you're on the uh, panel, so you can make comments. So That's I can't right. take that as a comment. <laughs> <laughs> but obviously, it is a comment. Um, our next question is from Mike Honeyball. Um, a lot of Australians feel nothing but uh, contempt and betrayal towards uh, Australians who would go overseas and join extremist groups like ISIS. Um, how do we reconcile that fact with the need to implement good policy that involves um, you know, people who've been overseas and been involved in these sorts of um, you know, atrocities and come back and actually realise the error of their ways? In other words, how do we implement good de-radicalisation policy um, when both sides of politics seem to be playing to the most base instincts uh, within the community? And Ali, we'll start with you. It's your area of expertise. Good, good question. Good question. Um, I think before we start talking about de-radicalisation, we need to revisit what we mean by radicalisation. Radicalisation has become a blanket term to describe a whole range of different processes, levels, um, uh, behaviours that are seen to be indicative of a particular mindset and, importantly, a, um, a willingness and an intention to commit violence. And that's not always the case. Um, you know, uh, we, we, we rely on models of radicalisation that are very hypothetical. Uh, in fact, most of what you hear about radicalisation in the media is mired in myth, um, in um, uh, hypothesis and in, in, in theory and in misconceptions. Uh, a lot of it is not true. There are a lot of misconceptions around radicalisation and we need to get that right before we start talking about de-radicalisation, uh, particularly because uh, the current wave that we're seeing of, of young people going overseas to fight is very different from what it was five years ago, very different from what it was ten years ago. And the process by which they are changing their world view and their ideological outlet uh, outlook to the point where they are willing to go overseas to commit acts of violence is a very different process today than it was ten years ago. Yet we're still relying on models that were developed 10 years ago based on very little empirical evidence. Very little empirical evidence. And can I just... Um, of... is, it, is it in fact true, mm. I've seen it reported, that you were in the process of recruiting 
Zaki Mallard to be part of a de-radicalisation de program? Not a de-radicalisation program. We did reach out to him through my NGO, People Against Violent Extremism, because we utilise the voices of formers, both former white supremacists and former jihadists um, and uh, uh, formers from different ideological uh, uh, um, groups. Uh, we utilise their voices as um, a way of challenging the, uh, the ideology of, of, of violent extremist groups. So, yes, we had reached out to Zaki and we will continue to reach out to Zaki and we continue to put out an invitation to Zaki to come work with us and to help him and support him in, in um, articulating his views because, you know, yeah, he's said some shitty stuff, OK? But he's also said some really good stuff too. Um, and, you know, the shitty stuff that he says, it's because he's... He's not groomed, he's not media savvy, and he's not politically savvy. Uh, but he could be a really strong voice and a really powerful voice. Um, he just needs the right kind of support. Paul Kelly. Uh, well, uh, I think it's very, very valuable, as I said earlier on, to uh, mobilise uh, jihadists who have repented. Uh, I think they can be enormously effective in dissuading people. Uh, to go to uh, Iraq and Syria. But look, uh, I guess the wider point I'd make about uh, this debate we're having, Tony, um, I, think, I think the ABC has got to pick up the signals it's getting from Malcolm Turnbull, who wants to help this organisation. And I think it's a mistake for the ABC to close ranks, defend the program, uh, live by a tokenistic apology and not take any substantive follow-up action. Substantive follow-up action by the ABC about this issue and this program is required. Uh, and I think this is a question of leadership of the ABC. It goes to the managing director, it goes to the chairman and it goes to the board. Now, these aren't just my views. These are very widespread views. I support the ABC. I want to see a strong, vibrant, independent, impartial ABC. This concept is in real trouble at the moment. And if the leadership of the ABC is not savvy enough and smart enough to realise this and recognise that it's got to take some serious decisions about this issue, then that's going to be, I think, a very disappointing outcome for everybody. Paul, uh, you did go off the uh, question there, but since you have so far, I'd like to um, get Tanya Plibersek just to respond to that. Well, I'd say Malcolm Turnbull's such a great friend of the ABC, he's cut $500 million from its budget. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think that's the test, Tanya. I don't think we use... I don't think we use how many dollars are spent on the ABC as the ultimate test of one's uh, support for the ABC as a minister, given the current fiscal situation. It's not the only uh, test. You know, you know, I keep wanting to go back to the question, actual question. Mm -hmm. and, and, um, the, and, and I was fascinated by your response. And one of the things you said that I thought was really important is that you also work with white supremacists. Yeah. And, you know, there was a, an article that just came out in the United States newspapers that said, actually, people in the United States are much more threatened by right-wing extremists than by jihadists. I don't know deaths. if the same is true in, in Australia, but I would be surprised. You know, everyone focuses on this one area. That sort of leaves out September 11. Um, yeah, up, since 9-11, there have been more deaths from white supremacist um, forms of violent extremism in the US than there have been from jihadist And everyone is focus, focusing on the jihadists, but I, I, I don't know if the situation is the same in Australia. I would su suggest there are probably white supremacists here. And, and the question is, is, is there as much a threat to the average Australian because of that? Well, OK, yeah. um, I'm sorry, but it is time to move on to other topics. Uh, we do have some other questions. Um, this one comes from Eva Klima. Uh, my, my question is for Tanya Pulvasek. Um, the ABC's documentary, The Killing Season, showed the way Julia Gillard was treated as the first female Prime Minister and highlighted that Bill Shorten lied about his role in her demise. Do you think the next female Prime Minister will be treated better? And if so, should Bill Shorten now step aside and let you take over as leader? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, 
Thanks, Eva. And I'll just go to the question of uh, not telling the truth first. We've got a Prime Minister who went into an election campaign saying no cuts to health, no cuts to education, no cuts to the ABC or SBS, no change to pensions and no new taxes, and he's broken every single one of those promises. Um, I don't think Bill Shorten was making a promise. He was making a series of bland statements or denials and in a radio interview. Are you at all disturbed and, uh, and at how no, well, easily... He lied under those circumstances, as he's your leader. Tony, uh, I, I think um, when there's a whole lot of turmoil in a political party, you don't want to be the person who's pouring petrol on that turmoil. So, uh, uh, can I just confirm what you're saying there, that lying under those circumstances is acceptable for a politician? I, I never think lying's acceptable, Tony. Yeah. I, don't, I never think lying's acceptable, but it's understandable when there's a whole lot of chaos that you don't want to contribute more to the chaos. I think the fundamental question of keeping faith with the Australian people goes to a Prime Minister who's cut all the things he said he wouldn't cut. He went into an election campaign saying uh, that um, taxes would be lower under them, spending would be lower under them, uh, and we've got higher taxes, higher spending, higher debt, higher deficit, higher unemployment, lower consumer confidence, slower economy and slower wages growth. That's the record. Paul Kelly. Uh, well, look, um, I think... I might just say about, uh, about the program, Tony, I think this was a brilliant program. <laughs> We're not <laughs> talking about Q&A now, is that right? <laughs> <laughs> this, was, this was the ABC at its best, mm -hmm. uh, and I enjoyed That's it. That's what Tony Abbott said in Parliament. Well, well, well he did, he did, and I think, uh, I think a lot of people uh, uh, f felt that. Look... Uh, Let's get to the substantive is, issue of the question. This is a really difficult uh, area for politicians. Uh, my own view is that political morality is different to personal morality. I know people won't want to hear that. They won't want to believe it. It's the truth. I'm delighted to hear Tanya say that it's uh, never acceptable to tell lies in politics. Well, that is a wonderful ideal. But, but, but uh, most politicians from time to time are, uh, are in a situation where if they don't lie, they have to fudge. They have to fudge. Now that is the reality of politics. I'd like to see. I'd like to see more integrity in the political system. I think Bill Shorten, in that particular interview, was guileless. I mean, he should not have been caught out like that. He should have been much smarter, much cleverer. Are you saying he's a poor liar? <laughs> well, well, um, yes. <laughs> Yes, is the answer to that question. But politicians have got to learn how to dissemble lie. effectively. How to lie. How to lie better, I guess. Yeah. No, no, no. There's a difference between dissembling, dissembling effectively and outright lying. Bill Shorten was caught outright lying. It's an interesting um, distinction. Do you think the public gets it? No, the public... No, the public uh, expect... Um, wall-to-wall -wall integrity in politics, mm. and I think that's good. I mean, it's important to have very, very high public standards, but I know how difficult it is. I know how difficult it is given the competing responsibilities that politicians have. Given do, that... Do you honestly think the public expects politicians not to lie? <laughs> no, no, I'm saying I mean, the I think public... they all assume politics. I mean... Yeah, anyway. I'm I thought it was well, a qualification that you had to have. Yeah. Well, I think the well Australian... apparently the qualification is you need to do it better. Oh, OK. Uh, yeah. Or dissemble, I think. Was well, what you said. I think the Australian public is very realistic and cynical about politicians. Mm. Having said that, I also think the Australian public imposes a severe penalty on politicians and do you, when so, a politician um, is caught out that, lying that is a, that, so that, that's a, I just want to finish this section by asking you, do you think Bill Shorten will pay a serious penalty for being caught out lying on this occasion? I think he'll pay a degree of penalty for being caught out on this issue, but I don't think this is going to be uh, decisive. This, this particular question, I don't think this will be decisive for him. The problem Bill Shorten's got is there's a question mark about what he believes. There's a question mark about his underlying convictions and beliefs simply because he looks too expedient, he's changed his mind on too many issues, in particular, of course, in terms of the leadership under the previous government. OK, we're going to move on. Uh, we've got another question. It's from uh, Keenan Fitzsimmons. Uh, Professor Lawrence Krauss, I'm a Year 8 student and I would love to pursue a career in the field of theoretical physics or cosmology. 
I'm also a devout Catholic and have a very strong faith. I am particularly interested uh, in black holes and where we are situated in the universe. Wow. The great physicist Albert Einstein once said, science without religion is lame, religion without science is blind. Do you believe there is a place in this world where both science and religion can be compatible and work side by side? And that's a Keenan Fitzsimons, apologies. Uh, go ahead. Well, that's a good question. First of all, I applaud your interest in, in that area and I encourage you to, to continue it. Um, independent of your beliefs, because the great thing about science is that the, the black holes exist or not, whether or not you believe in God. It's, it, that's the wonderful thing about science. God's kind of irrelevant. Uh, it, your beliefs are, are, don't really matter. And that's why there are scientists of all sorts, some who are devout Catholics, some who a great many who don't believe. I think the, when you say can science and religion be compatible, it's a, it's a complex question, because religion is a very diffuse thing. When people often, take that remark of Einstein's. Einstein also said that the god of organized religion is a fairy tale, is a myth, is silly, and people should give it up like they did Santa Claus. I mean, he, so his, his view of religion was more, he his, was sort of a, uh, a Spinozan kind of religion where the, the notion that there's order in the universe and we should revere that order in the universe. He never believed in a, in a creator that had any personal interest in anyone. So when you talk about religion, you have to be more careful. The vague notion that the universe is amazing and maybe somehow that gives you meaning, that's not incompatible with science. What is incompatible with science is the doctrines of all the world's organized religions. Those are incompatible with science. Can I just ask you a quick question? Um, would you take the view that science has not proven that God doesn't exist? It could never prove. And it, that God is, science can never disprove God. Because, you know, I, I could say that God created us here 12 seconds ago. How could I disprove that? With all with the memories of, of the wonderful discussion that we just had, you know, because it was God's kind of sadistic. Believe and, me, and, it'll be on <laughs> tape somewhere. We've yeah. seen that before. And, and so I could never disprove that. So science can never disprove the notion of God. But the really interesting question is that we make it seem as if science, this question of God is important to science. It's irrelevant. Most scientists don't even think about God enough to know if they're atheists. When you, when you go in the laboratory, you're working in the laboratory, and when devoutly... Christian or, what, or Jewish or whatever, and I know, have many friends who are deeply religious, when they go in the laboratory, God goes out the window. So your religious beliefs should be separate from your interest in science, and, but it is disingenuous, and although it offends people, it's disingenuous to argue that the doctrines, the world's organized religions are consistent with science, because they're not. All right. Um, and Ali, what do you think about this? Uh, talking about science and black holes and stuff hurts my head. <laughs> Um, <laughs> we should have talked later. Okay. Do, 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 you believe, do you believe in a creator? Let's put it that way. I, I believe in a creator, but that's my personal belief, and I believe that belief is very personal. So I, I believe that um, a creator, for some people, is God, for some people it's Yahuwah, for some people it's Allah, for some people it's, 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 it's whatever organised religion tells you it is. But I also think that for some people it's this incredible energy that is out there in the universe that binds us all together um, and that, you know, but you it, can't... But it can't be God, it can't be Allah and all... They, they all can't be right, right? So, so either, either one but of them is right or wrong. they are all right. No, but they are all right because there is something bigger than us and you oh, can't... But it's not like Allah, I, it's not Jesus and it's not Moses and it's not... I mean, the point is every... As I've said on be. this program before, every person of deep faith is an atheist about every other religion. Well, uh, <laughs> it's, it's, it, it is whatever you want it to be. And I, you know, like I, I go for walks sometimes or I work in my garden and it's really hard to look around you and see all this wonderful stuff around you and not believe that there's something bigger than, uh, than us. Well, there is. It, there's a galaxy and there's... Oh, no, 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 you're not my brain. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I want to bring in Paul Kelly here. Paul, you're a, you're a man of faith, so um, what, are you, what are your reflections You on... don't know a lot about my faith, too. <laughs> no, I, I, I presume you are a believer in God. OK, well, I, I do um, uh, think there's a greater force. I am a believer in a greater force. Uh, I think that religion and science are separate. I think they can endure together. I agree completely that when a scientist goes into the laboratory, all he's interested in is science, not religion. I understand that uh, completely. But I think the two are very different domains. Uh, one is the domain of reason, the other is the domain of faith, and I don't think there's anything inherently incompatible between them. Tim Wilson. 
Well, I don't broadly disagree with um, what Paul just said. The key thing I would add, though, is that when you get to the frontiers of science and you see this in discussions around artificial intelligence and issues around genetics and, and innovation, uh, that morality, which often comes from religion, can inform people's perspectives about what's well, well, right or I'm ethical or just. I'm always amazed when people say morality comes from religion. I think most people's morality comes from rationality. They claim it comes from religion, and that's the real problem. Religion well, has usurped this notion that somehow it has a, a monopoly on morality. If you didn't believe in God, you wouldn't go out and kill your neighbor the next day. Your, that comes from a sense of rationality and empathy with others. It doesn't come from religion, and, and people claim it does, and people often say they're religious just because they think if they say they're not, people will think they're bad people, and that's the real problem today. I said can come yeah. from religion. Mm -hmm. Morality has different components is to that it, like, and people have ethics and moral dimensions which don't come from well, religion. The, the Old but Testament is one of the most immoral books ever written. The key point is when yeah. you get to the okay. frontiers of science, issues around religion can inform how people approach the exploration and that is always a, a, a tension because being somebody who isn't a faith, uh, I'm always in favour of seeing how far we can take scientific prog progress. I accept that there are limits and we have to assess and make proper judgment calls about making sure we're not make, taking so too much when risk. when religion says, say, being gay is evil and science can show there's, not, there's no empirical basis for that, you say there's no inconsistency? Well, it's not about consistency. People are entitled to their views, well, even it, it if can I be disagree wrong. with them. That's what happens in but a free religion, society. But for many people, their religion tells them something that's manifestly wrong. Are we supposed sure. to yeah. accept that that's... or just not say it's silly? No, of course you're allowed to say it's okay. silly. In fact, you're supposed to go out there and When, you, when the you say people are entitled to their views... Of course they are. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> I'm just saying. Once again, Tony Jones, you have used this platform to make a snide remark and aside, rather than actually addressing the fundamental issue. I didn't even. Hang on, I didn't hang on, finish on, my sentence. You're, you're assuming what I was going to say. People are entitled to their views. Whether the national broadcaster gives it a platform right. is entirely different okay. issue. No, people are entitled to their views, but the whole point is we're entitled to find their views ridiculous. Of and course what we amazes are. me. No, but what amazes me is is that. In, in the, our society, we're entitled to attack politicians, we're entitled to make fun of sex, we're entitled to make fun of everything else. But the minute you suggest that the views of, of the Pope are absolutely silly, suddenly you're viewed as strident and, and, and inappropriate. And the point is, there should be nothing that's sacred. Everything should be open to debate, including religion. No one's disputing that as far as well. Can I hear from Tanya Plibersek on the question of religion and science? Uh, well, I like Lawrence's books very much, and especially the science of Star Trek one. <laughs> um, I guess I'm almost the exact opposite to each of well, the two of you. Uh, I don't think that there's a life after death. I don't think there's a heaven or hell. Um, but I believe deeply and profoundly in some of the lessons that uh, Lawrence says that it's not religion, it's morality. But... Religion is a really good way of um, describing and telling stories to people. And um, Sometimes good, sometimes not so good. Would yeah, you no, agree? No, no, that's true. It, yeah. it, it can be quite damaging yeah. too, I accept that. But, um, you know, I, I went to church every Sunday as a kid and the things that sunk in for me were judge not lest ye be judged, um, pull the plank out of your own eye before you reach for the splinter in your brother's, um, uh, the story of the Good Samaritan, Sir Frederick Osnam saying that uh, charity is pouring oil on the wounds of the traveller, um, but justice is preventing the attack in the first place. Mm -hmm. um, actually, uh, sitting there for an hour a week and thinking through the way you want to live your life is um, perhaps a bit of a luxury in a busy modern world. I, I agree completely with what you're saying, but the question is, does it... I think it would be great to sit... And have uh, you know every Sunday talk about quantum mechanics too, but yeah. but uh, I would do that with you, Lawrence. In fact, I it would may do be more useful. But I think what you've yeah. illustrated is, is a really key point. Many people who call themselves religious in one way or another, what they do is they pick and choose the things that appeal to them, and they and they throw out the rest. And most of the rest is the real doctrine. You know, most of them don't believe when you eat a wafer that turns into the body of Christ. But they yeah. but but they like some of the things they read. So most people really 
aren't really Christians. What they are is they like some of the things they read in the Bible and, and they identify with that and it makes it and it makes them more acceptable in the rest of society to identify with that. Okay. I think, uh, actually, can I just make yes, a point yes, about can. this? Um, I think that that actually might be a bit of a difference between American society and Australian society. I, I don't think you get well, judged. Well, for example, yet. Um, if you were in American society, you wouldn't have said what you said earlier about being a non-believer and expect to become a leader of the country. Well, it's, it's well, absolutely true. It's, it's, I was so impressed with you saying that uh, it, because in true, in the United States, uh, you know, there's been a study in Americans that it, being atheist is is the, is viewed on the level as being a rapist. It's the same thing. It's, um, well, that's a good time to move us. Uh, the next question is from Jackie Olling. How long do you think it will be before a long overdue referendum is put to the Australian people to recognise the rights of Indigenous people in the Constitution? Would you also support increased representation of Indigenous people in the Federal Parliament as a further constitutional amendment? Paul Kelly. I'm very worried about the referendum. Uh, I'm very committed to recognising the Indigenous peoples in the Constitution. Uh, I think this is something we need to do as a country. We need to repair the current Constitution. What I'm concerned about is I think that the lack of consensus on this issue is worse now than what it was four or five years ago. When I look at the history of referendums in this country, my own view is that the best way for this referendum to get up is for it to be a modest proposal to be an important symbolic proposal and for it to have a wide degree of bipartisanship. I'm particularly disappointed... Is the Noel Pearson model effectively? No, I'm not, I'm not talking about the Noel Pearson model, no, no. Uh, but I'm particularly disappointed with the report from the Joint Parliamentary Committee at the end of last week. Uh, this is quite a radical document. It wants to have a constitutional guarantee of racial non-discrimination. I think that's got no chance of getting up whatsoever. It's certainly unacceptable to the governing parties. Uh, what we need to do is we need to rethink the issue. We need to be realistic. We need to recognise that as a country, it's very important that we do this. We've got to find a shared common ground, rejecting those people on the right who say any referendum is unacceptable, that that is putting race into the Constitution. I reject that. We've also got to reject a number of people, and unfortunately, a number of Aboriginal leaders who are, who are bidding up, who are bidding up a very ambitious referendum, which I think at the end of the day will be doomed. Can, can I just ask you, uh, we mentioned Noel Pearson before, and of course the question referred to uh, special represent or increased representation of some form for Indigenous people um, in the Parliament. Uh, now, Noel Pearson was talking about something existing outside of the par Parliament, but a representative body advising the Parliament effectively. Um, do, do you reject that idea? Do you think that's too ambitious? I don't think we can have that body in the Constitution. Uh, I don't think that's going to work. I don't think the people would vote for that. Uh, I understand why Noel is doing this. Noel is attempting to find some common ground. Uh, he recognises that this referendum is in serious difficulty. Uh, I'm sympathetic to what he's trying to do. I can't uh, sign off on his actual proposals. OK, uh, Tanya Plibersek, um, there was a suggestion there that uh, both the major parties would reject the idea, I think some of the ideas from the Parliamentary Joint Committee, including the uh, specific prohibition against racial discrimination. Mm, well, I think we, um, we have to look at that a lot more closely. I, it, Paul's right to say that there shouldn't be a proposal that's guaranteed to fail. It would be a disaster to have you a think referendum. So? Can I, can I just, uh, just I'm not saying off, off. that this is that okay. proposal. I'm just saying that the, the, the discussion about the question that is actually put or the questions that are put mm. is, I think, the most important part of this. Uh, if, you can get, um, uh, if you can get a bipartisan campaign uh, on this, then a referendum would have a great deal... A, a great chance of success. So very briefly, um, there's no the, the, just, just to, of... I'm sorry to, to interrupt you there, but we're, we're running out of time and I'd just like to get to the point here. The, the Parliamentary Joint Committee is, in fact, was bipartisan yes. in, in a sense. So it had a yeah. Labor, um, significant Labor member and yep. significant uh, Liberal member, both Indigenous. They came up with the idea or the conclusion that it was important to put into the Constitution a prohibition against racial discrimination. And, and they've done great work and thoughtful work and now we have to look at the report and take some time to examine it to discuss it more broadly. And uh, Tim Wilson. Well, I think what 
the committee should have focused on is removing the existing race power rather than putting in a new non-discrimination provision. But fundamentally, we don't have a proposal, uh, whether it's the expert working group's panel uh, proposal, whether it's the one that was put up by the Wyatt Group or one that's put forward by Noel Pearson at the moment that I believe in its current form can be successful. I think we have to start looking very clearly at uh, issues outside of the Constitution to drive Aboriginal advancement and uh, working with my colleague, the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Social Justice Commissioner Mick Gooder, we're doing a, a significant project looking at how to capture the value of, uh, of Aboriginal lands and Indigenous lands to actually drive economic development that has a practical effect for Indigenous Australians. Uh, Mick is working with uh, Aboriginal leaders uh, to try and resolve some sort of proposal that can work on a constitutional level. But I would have thought that if you look at what is going to be put up and if it's going to be successful, it has to appease uh, Indigenous Australians constitutional conservatives and a group that's often ignored, which is constitutional liberals, which in the end makes the most part of the Australian population. And the window to get a proposal to do that, I think, is very challenging indeed. And we don't have one of those at the moment. I'm afraid we're out of time. We've just gone to time and that is all we have time for. So please thank our panel, Tanya Plibersek, Tim Wilson, Paul Kelly, Anne Alley and Lawrence Krauss. Next Monday, next Monday on Q&A, the Deputy Nationals Leader and Minister for Agriculture, Barnaby Joyce, Shadow Immigration Minister, Richard Miles, Green Senator, Larissa Waters, Leading News Corp commentator, Piers Ackerman, and from the Centre of Independent Studies, Tricia Jar. Until next week's Q&A, good night.